Welcome to this episode of the Business of Practice podcast, where we focus on the physical, financial, and human sides of equine veterinary medicine. In this episode, we're talking about dealing with dissatisfied clients with Colleen Best, DBM, PhD, CCFP. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equimanagement. The Business of Practice podcast is brought to you by Decra Veterinary Products. Dr. Best's PhD research focused on relationships in equine practice, including veterinarian client and referring veterinarian specialist communication. Dr. Best operates her own business, Best Vet Coaching and Consulting in Ontario. Thank you, Dr. Best, for joining us today to talk about dealing with dissatisfied clients. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, Dr. Best, you have an upset client. How do you personally, as the veterinarian, set yourself up to deal with that client? The first thing I usually do is pause and I take a calm breath and I think to myself, you are safe, you are okay. And I do that because when someone is upset with me, I can perceive that as a threat. And when I feel threatened, I usually need to defend myself. And so I know going in, if I don't manage that, I want to defend myself. I want to be right. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm good that I'm unlikely to manage the situation well. So from a physiological standpoint, I know that if I take sort of a few calming breaths, depending on the situation where I have sort of a two to three second inhale, maybe a five second exhale, the key being the exhale is longer than the inhale, that I'm going to help my body calm down, get out of that I'm threatened place. And that's going to position my brain well to help me navigate things with the client. And once I've done that, I try very hard to ask a question. Because when someone is unhappy, I really don't usually have all of the information because I never set out to do something that would leave someone feeling dissatisfied or unhappy with the care that I provided. So I try to appreciate that in every interaction and every sort of situation in life, there's my understanding of what happened, the other person's understanding of what happened and what a video camera would say happened. And so knowing that my view is only maybe one of one of at least three perspectives. I like to invite the client to share with me their experience. So I try to ask an open ended question. Tell me more about that. Um, hmm, that like that's interesting. Help me understand what happened. Help me understand what's going on. Help me understand what you know, why you're upset. Although I usually do try to avoid the word why, but just giving them an opportunity to share with me their perspective is helpful. And from there, I usually try to be quiet for a little bit. If they sort of go runaway train and just blast me in an incoherent way, that's not contributing positively to my understanding of what's happening. I'll try to slow the interaction down by using a reflective listening statement. So repeating back to them what they've shared with me or saying, I'm just going to stop you there to make sure I've I've understood you correctly so far. Because one of the other things that can happen when people are in a really primed emotional state is that things go really fast. And usually when someone is upset, we want to slow things down. And by me starting taking a calm breath, that hopefully gives them a little bit of contagiousness to also slow down. Um, But I can also use reflective listening statements and my body language to help slow them down so that we can have a meaningful back and forth conversation about what's happened. And like you had mentioned one time that empathy is not agreement. Would you explain what you mean by that? So that's another key piece, you know, while we're listening, we can use a reflective listening statement that says like, okay, so I'm hearing that um, you, you know, you didn't realize that the medication needed to be given four times a day in order to work properly. Say we're dealing with an an eye ulcer or something. 
Um, what might also be happening when, okay, they didn't understand, they might feel guilty or upset. And so what empathy is about is reflecting their experience back to them. So yeah, I see you're really upset that, you know, um, it wasn't clear how to um, administer the medication or the importance of giving the medication that many times. And now you're feeling really worried because the ulcer is getting worse, not better. So you'll notice I didn't say that I explained it poorly. I said that you didn't understand that, that the medication needed to be given this much. Okay. Um, but also that's their experience, whether I have it written in my files. And this happened to me the other day. I wrote in the files, client knows she needs to come back and pick up more meds in two weeks. And when I saw her a month after, uh, you know, a month out at a next recheck, she was like, oh, I didn't know. And I was like, I wrote it in my file. I know that you know, I know that I told you. And I felt exasperated. And then I thought, well, maybe because of her stress, because wherever she was on that day, she didn't remember. That's okay. It doesn't mean that I was wrong. It just means that that interaction wasn't optimized for her. And I can learn and do better next time. So this time around, I put a reminder in the computer and I'll make sure that we call her to remind her to pick up the meds at two weeks out because they didn't work without their next round last time. So by, by using an empathy statement that says, I hear your experience or I see you're feeling upset, we're not agreeing with them that that's, that's warranted in the situation or whatever. We're just saying, I see you and I see where you are. And there's tremendous power in that. So I can see that you're worried that this ulcer isn't getting better. Yeah, they probably are worried. Okay, that's not agreeing that it's my fault that the ulcer is getting worse. Heck, sometimes ulcers just get worse even if they were giving their meds appropriately, right? But we can validate their experience. We can support the client feeling seen, which helps build the relationship and supports trust between both people because they feel that there's that that you see who they are and what's going on for them and when we support that that strong relationship then we're more likely to have effective interactions and we reduce the likelihood that we're going to have these sort of challenging dissatisfied upset experiences so one of the things that we know that that clients get upset about are bills so how do you talk about money when you're talking about a physical issue in the horse? So this one, you know, it ties into sort of how we sort of prevent dissatisfied clients. And there are a few things sort of in life and in, in veterinary medicine that are sort of common breeding grounds for dissatisfaction or upset feelings. Um, and, and they sort of are centered around expectations, um, goals and money. And so if a client, for whatever reason, has an expectation that the cost is going to be one thing and and it's considerably more, then they're going to be unsatisfied because their expectations of cost weren't met. Similarly, if the client was expecting um, a problem to heal up, a lameness to resolve in a certain amount of time and it doesn't, they're going to be upset because their expectations weren't met. So when we think about general expectations, it's important to ask the client at the start of an interaction, what are your what are your expectations for our visit today? What are your expectations for, you know, moving forward in this problem? Um, you know, maybe what's your timeline even just to better understand where the client is. Most equine clients are experienced to some degree. They might have worked with another veterinarian. I call these sort of ghosts. They have these ghost beliefs. And if we don't know about the ghost, then the ghost kind of sabotages us, right? Whether it's from the client being upset, the client not following our instructions. But when we ask questions like, what are your expectations? What do you know about this problem? Um, you know, have you, have you been through this before? Tell me about it. Then we start to learn more about where the client is coming from. And if there are... Um, beliefs that are no longer accurate, if there are inaccuracies, if there are things that you do differently, then that's the opportunity to upfront discuss it with the client instead of getting down the road, learning about these ghosts that have sabotaged you 
And then they've eroded the trust in the relationship because an expectation hasn't been met. Similarly, when that comes with cost, you know, hopefully as we go through, you know, clients are upfront told about this is what a farm call is, this is what an exam fee is. And when we're discussing options for care, treatment, diagnostics, we explain the costs associated alongside the, the benefit of doing those different procedures. And we know from research in companion animal medicine that oftentimes cost is explained um, as like, well, this is how much the machine is, or this is how much time it takes my staff. But generally, again, companion animal clients wanted to understand what the benefit is to the pet in doing that diagnostic. So, you know, I'd like to do x-rays to better understand um, whether we're seeing radiographic changes of arthritis, that's going to help me care for Simon in these different ways. And the costs associated with that is X. You know, we could go forward and, some, and inject the joints um, on our belief of this, that costs Y. Um, and, and being upfront and saying, if we do do the X-rays, we're probably also still going to want to do the joint injection to treat it. We'll just have a better understanding of what's going on. So sharing with the client those different pieces of information, the different costs associated with them, and sometimes the next steps when we have to say, hey, this diagnostic isn't going to fix anything, but without the diagnostic, I'm shooting in the dark to try to fix it. So the money we spend on treatment might need to be spent again on a different treatment if we've, you know, if it wasn't the most common thing that I think it is. But again, having those conversations with the clients upfront, helping them explain sort of their resource allocation, what they're getting out of the money that they're spending, and also awareness of the money they're spending before it is spent is going to help them manage their expectations for care, their expectations of that bill, and, and support a transparent, trusting relationship with you because they're not being surprised. Because the cost of these sort of unmet expectations, whether it's around the outcomes of care or, or the bill, are that trust erosion, which we know then does predispose to a client being unsatisfied. Decra Veterinary Products is proud to sponsor Equimanagement's The Business of Practice podcast. Decra's equine product line includes Osphos, Clotronate Injection, Orthocon Vet IREP 10 and 60, Osteocon PRP, Equidone Gel from Peridone, the Vetivex line of parenteral fluids, Phycox EQ joint supplement, and a comprehensive line of topical dermatologic products. The recent addition of Zymeta, Diaperone Injection, further expands Decra's equine offerings. For more information about Decra's products, please visit decra-us.com. And I know something you've said before, and I'm going to repeat it here. Sometimes guilt looks ugly and clients throw it on us. Oh, guilt looks so ugly. And, and what I mean by that is when, when clients feel guilty, whether it's based on a choice that they've made, based on the fact that they're not able to afford um, perhaps the gold standard of care, you know, we provide our clients options, even if we don't think they can afford it, right? We say, here are the options. You know, based on what I know about you and Simon, here's where I think, you know, we could start. Here's the benefits and risks to each. But when clients can't afford perhaps what they perceive as the best part of care or something goes sideways when they couldn't do the gold standard care, they can feel quite guilty and they can feel ashamed of themselves that they weren't able to afford that care. And then with those really uncomfortable feelings they're having, they would like to make them go away. And one thing one way of doing that is by saying, here, this is all your fault, and we blame. And most of us probably have done this with respect to something at some point in our lives. We say, like, yeah, this thing went really bad for me, and I just want to find someone to blame because it feels better than having it all weigh on me. And so, you know, that can look like um, shaming us around, you don't care about animals, you're just in it for the money, how could you, this was your mistake, you never told me when we know, because we wrote it in our medical records, that we, we did. Or we know that we presented all the options and they couldn't afford referral. And you no, know, maybe it's not surprising that that colic didn't make it. 
but the client's guilt shows up as anger and it shows up as blame. And so a, a key piece for me is remembering that guilt can look ugly and the client is having those difficult feelings. And even though they're trying to put them on me, um, I, I don't know how many of you might have ever listened to Sharon Lois and Bram as a kid, but there is a kid song that goes, don't throw your junk in my backyard. My backyard's full. Um, that's often what I say to myself in my head, which is, hey, that's that's yours. That's your blame. That's your that's your big, uncomfortable feeling. It's not mine. And so I can I can relate and I can be empathetic. You know, I can say, like, I can see you're feeling really awful about about what's going on with Sophie right now and that and that you know and that referral wasn't an option and and I want you to know that like we're doing our best for her given given the resources we have that's still okay we can normalize not having endless resources because very few people do right we can help them work through those feelings we can partner with them and say here's what we can do we can empower them. We can help them care for their horse in a way that they're able to manage. You know, and recognize like, yeah, this is really hard. Like, I wish it were different. I wish it weren't so expensive. I wish can be a really useful phrase in those in those situations because I often wish that vet care was cheaper. Of course I do. Unfortunately, it's, it's not. And I'm not in control of most of that. I mean, clients can say, yes, you are. You set your price as well. We all know that it's not that simple. So appreciating that when a client is just putting stuff on us because they're having such a difficult time, sort of holding that boundary of that's their difficult time. I didn't do anything wrong. I am not going to own their limitations, their choices, things that are out of my control because I don't get to decide how they allocate their personal resources in their family. I didn't decide that they should buy a horse. You know, I, any of these things were not my decision. So I'm not gonna suddenly own the parts of their decisions that relate to their horse's vet care. What I can do is I can be there with them, help them understand, hopefully work with them to provide the best care possible given the, given the resources that they do have available. And one thing that she said, and I just want to reiterate this, is you can't rush with someone who is upset. This is a really hard thing, and it goes back to that moment at the start of, you know, if they're upset, they're, you know, their sympathetic nervous system is probably, you know, their fight or flight has been engaged. And that's why I always start by being very intentional and quieting mine, because when everybody is really keyed up, things tend to fly back and forth. And when we're sort of in that fight or flight and things are flying back and forth, there tends to be poor listening. So people are not aware of really what's happening. They're not in control of their emotions. They're not a good decision maker. And those are all key things. When I think about effective ways to work with a client, I do need, I need to be able to hear them and they need to be able to hear me. I need them to be sort of in some control of their emotions so that they can make a rational decision. And so that idea of how can I slow things down? Okay. And even saying like, I'd like to take some time to understand what's happened. Okay. And if they, yeah, come at you gangbusters, say like, I, I'm going to stop you there for just a moment to make sure I understand what you've told me so far. Okay, and just summarize. Okay, so you're you're upset about this, or you you didn't understand this, or the bill was more than you expected. Okay, help me understand that. Let's look at it together. Okay, so that type of idea, or even we get a text or a call, and and someone's really angry and upset. Don't respond right away. Give them some cooling down. Um, and if you feel you need to respond right away, say, I'll be happy to touch base with that. You know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this in a couple hours. I'm not able to right now. OK, so just that idea of we're not going to get into a flying back and forth place, a because I'm not I'm putting myself at a competitive disadvantage if I do. 
in terms of trying to get to a place where we're able to move constructively forward. And also appreciating that, you know, in, in today's world, many things go very, very fast, you know, with social media and texting and like we are constantly available and that's not necessarily helpful. It doesn't help us have perspective. It doesn't help us think things through and, and approach things in a calm fashion. So supporting sort of giving people the time that they need to, to, to want to resolve it constructively. That's the other thing. Go, like go into talking to a client with a, I think we can find a positive outcome here. I think we can move through this, right? Not like I'm just going to go and get yelled at and beat up and it's going to be really miserable. So just even that idea of I'm going to give this the time and the energy it needs because it's important. The client is important. The patient is important. And I'd like to resolve this in a way that everyone feels good about. And in order to do that, I'm going to need to devote time and resources. That's a very good point. Is there anything else um, on dealing with dissatisfied clients that you would like to add, Dr. Best? One thing that I struggle with is I really like to be right. I, I will admit that that's, uh, I like being right in life. Um, and sometimes I need to let go of that because it's not necessarily about being right or wrong. Hopefully it's about getting the patient the care that they need. Or even for me, learning more about what the client's experience has been because I didn't understand it from the start. So even though, you know, my perception of the event is that I was flawless and awesome, it's not my job to try to campaign to the client if they don't feel similarly that I was flawless and awesome. There's an opportunity for me to say, help me understand, you know, what was going on for you to learn more about how I came across in that situation and, and learn going forward. And so just that mindset of I can be curious, you know, I know who I am, I know what I'm good at, and it's not that I'm flawless and perfect, but it's that I am well-intentioned and that I try hard. Okay. The, what the client shares back with me doesn't necessarily mean that that's not true. It might mean that what I, what I was trying to do in that moment wasn't consistent or didn't meet the client's needs or expectations. And learning about that can help me do better next time. You know, accepting that I'm not perfect is not is not my favorite thing, but I also know that it's the, the, the state of the world, right? I am not perfect. Um, and I, a number of years ago now, watched a wonderful TED Talk and, and sort of had this idea of growth mindset, which is um, sort of a way of looking at how each of us have the ability to grow and change pioneered or introduced by um, psychologist Carol Dweck. Highly recommend the TED Talk. And what she talked about was that we all have the capacity to grow and change if we choose to. And it was such a powerful thing. And I realized that for so much of my life, I'd actually believed that I wasn't able to grow and change. I was just sort of stuck as me. And me being stuck as me meant that I never wanted to be wrong because that meant that I was wrong as a person. Whereas when I learned more about growth mindset, I learned that, hey, if I did something and it wasn't great or it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be, if I put in the time and the energy, I could grow and do better. And that was game changing for me. And, and I, I will give you a short example. So in vet school, I was not very good at pathology. It started in undergrad. I wasn't good at cell biology. Then I wasn't good at histology. I wasn't good at like the ologies, the virology and the bacteriology and all this stuff. I wasn't good at clin path. I was just bad. And I really thought it just meant that I was bad at pathology. And so I avoided it and felt that, you know, horses didn't, didn't get a ton of cancer. So I could mostly avoid clin path. I apologize to any pathologist listening. Um, but it was because I didn't want to be bad at it. So I always had other people sort of help me with my blood smears and stuff like that. I just never tried because I didn't want to be wrong and bad. But what I know now is that if I had tried, 
I could have gotten better and it wouldn't have been so scary and intimidating and it wouldn't have meant that I was bad. It just would have meant that I had maybe more room to grow in that area than I had to grow in anatomy. And so the same is true of most of the things in our life. If we recognize an area that maybe we're not as good as we want to be, instead of saying that makes me bad and not good enough and inadequate, say, hey, I can grow and learn. And so that belief, when I think about dealing with dissatisfied clients, it helps eliminate some of that taking it really personally, the fact that I wasn't flawless and amazing or that they didn't think I was flawless and amazing. So I can say, oh, in this specific situation with this client who's, you know, has X and Y going on and their horse had Z and K going on, I can improve this way next time. And when I believe that I can grow and change, I feel safer as a human being and I'm able to do that. And so that's been a really key piece to my being open to hearing feedback about myself that I would have historically tried to make untrue or historically just said, well, like, that's crap. That's the client. They weren't listening. That's not my fault. And so overall, that's made me better and stronger. Um, and I think, you know, I'm grateful um, for learning about it because it's been a really liberating experience for me and my understanding of myself. But I also think it's key when we think about how to deal with people who are different than us when it relates to them giving us feedback that helps us say, hey, well, I never thought of it that way. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm wrong. That just means in this situation, I, I you know, I have room to grow. And, and usually when we acknowledge that we can grow, it makes it a lot easier to do that. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for some of these great tips on dealing with dissatisfied clients. We want to thank our listeners for joining us today for the Business of Practice podcast. And a big thanks to our sponsor, Decra Veterinary Products. We invite you to visit equimanagement.com or your favorite podcast network, such as iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher, to hear each episode of the Business of Practice. If you have any questions or suggestions, you can send me an email at kbrown at equinenetwork.com. The Business of Practice podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.